Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Firefish Recruitment Crowdcast Live. My name is Matt Jelly, and today the topic is going to be how to avoid lowering your fee in a job short market. I'm delighted to welcome our special guest today, Mr. John Brooks. John is actually the only pricing consultant within the UK recruitment industry. He is also the founder of the company The Value Advantage and former pricing consultant and head of pricing at Reed. John, it's wonderful to have you here. How are you, sir? Very good. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me on. Well, it's great to see you. It's great to see you and really looking forward to digging into loads of questions on this massively interesting topic that, you know, affects pretty much everybody, really. Um, firstly, I'm also going to say to the audience, if you've got questions, and I can see a few have come through already, um, please pop them in the sidebar or in the ask a question option at the bottom of the page. You can also download our ebook, How to Sell Retainers in Recruitment. Um, so, John, as I say, loads and loads of questions. Really looking forward to the session today. Um, what I was going to first ask you maybe to do is just introduce yourself to the audience and just tell us a little bit more about what it's like being a, uh, a pricing consultant. Sure. Yeah. So my name's John. Been in the industry for over 15 years now. Um, as you say, uh, predominantly with Reed, which is a great experience. Um, and yeah, last year set up on my own as a pricing consultant um, because I'd seen the difference, the impact that uh, improved pricing can make on recruitment agencies. Um, so yeah, what does a what is a pricing consultant? I get that question a lot. Uh, there aren't many of us. Uh, I'm the only one in the recruitment industry. <laughs> um, so yeah, what I try and do in a nutshell is help my clients, in this case, recruitment agencies, to really understand what value they're creating for their clients. Mm -hmm. And actually, we'll talk more about this, I'm sure, but you can create different value for different types of clients. It's important to think about. And then the outcome of uh, what I do is creating new pricing models um, so that at the end of the day, you're going to win more business and make more money. Fantastic. Yeah. So there's some, some great wins there, obviously, for all sorts of companies, all different sizes and different sectors, uh, there, et cetera. And we're going to dig into some of those, those benefits as we go through. But let's, let's kick off, first of all, look, by looking really, you know, why is, you know, pricing and getting pricing right so important for recruitment agencies right now yeah as as you've titled this session um there's going to be a lot of pressure now on fees um historically there's always been pressure you know if you've plotted uh let's talk about perm fees across the last couple of decades there's been constant price pressure um the biggest pressure in that time of course was 2008 2009 and I've spoken to agencies and consultants who lowered their fees then mm -hmm. and haven't managed to bring them back up since. What, 10 years ago? Well, that's, yeah, exactly. Well, over 10 years ago, sorry. We must be talking, yeah, yeah 2008. So, so years ago. you think of the difference. You, you add that uh, discount in effect up. Mm -hmm. you know, they dropped their prices 10 years ago, and then they've had 10 years of getting less income than they could have. So yes, the pressure is going to be on again, and clients will be asking more than ever now to, for people to drop their fees. Um, so it's really important not to just discount um, and then have a decade of being stuck on low prices. But, but how can you avoid that, perhaps? I mean, you talk to recruiters, they're in there at the moment, you know, it's a job short market or job led market, sorry. And, you know, they're going to be they're going to feel compelled to to do that to win the business and to uh, to stay alive so to speak so you know why shouldn't they cut their fees right now sure um what i'm what i'm not suggesting is uh, you know i i sit here in my semi ivory tower and just say hey guys you know negotiate hard <laughs> i think that that's not the solution but what you need to do is plan your pricing and work out go in with a plan so you're aware that your clients are likely to push on price. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to go in with a pricing model you're confident in. And then you want to think, okay, if someone does push, what is my walkaway point? What mm -hmm. do I get in return if I'm discounting? Um, so 
be confident in your pricing. Um, clients always buy confidence, and this is true in any industry. Um, the most important place to have confidence is when you're negotiating and talking about price, right? That's not the time to crumble and worry about, um, you know, to, to uh, start being uncertain, uh, especially now clients are really going to pounce on that. So have a plan and know what you're willing to discount and what you're willing to do. So off the back of that, really, I mean, are we able to talk a bit more about, say, the link between service, value, and effective pricing? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think what's fascinating about recruitment is, um, as it stands now, we often go in and say, I can recruit. What I do for you is recruitment. And then we very quickly move on to price. So I actually want, we're not defining what the client wants and what the client values from us as recruiters. Um, so it's important and much more, uh, it's advantageous for us to go in and say, let me talk about the services I can offer. And let's talk about which service you need now for this moment, for this situation, for this role. Yeah, and the, the situation has changed so quickly from a candidate short market to a candidate rich market. Um, so to just go in and say, oh, I'll do recruitment like I did it last year, um, your client is going to think, well, everything has changed. Um, so if you can go in and say, right, let's talk about the services I can offer. Let's talk about what services would be important to you. Um, then you start talking about the value you're creating and what the clients value. That starts to show what they're willing to pay for. And that's when you start talking about uh, setting your prices um, and also you, you can gain more confidence in then negotiating if you know what they're interested in if you're trying to sell a service they're not interested in then yeah they're probably not going to buy it but you're certainly not going to get a good price for it okay so we're looking at you know linking again there as well business strategy through to your pricing model and the importance of that exactly and um, i look at what else recruiters are doing at the moment around yeah, COVID and the, the lockdown pause, I guess, gave recruiters and agency owners the chance to think about what was important to them. And you see them investing in um, focusing on a specific niche. I think that's really valuable to do that. I think a lot of people on here will have done that. Um, investing in their brand, consultants investing in their personal brand, investing in a good CRM, uh, yeah, all of these things. But you're investing time, you're investing money, you're putting your effort into that. That has to then tie into price. If you then say, I'll match any competitor, then you've just wasted that effort. You, you might as well just compete on price. If you're going to get a decent CRM, if you're going to build a great perception of you in your niche and what you can do for your clients and your clients are coming to you saying, what can you do? and then you match a competitor's price, you're wasting all of that energy. You know, big picture, the point of running a business is to make money. Um, so if you're investing all that energy and then dropping your price without a plan, uh, as I say, if you have a plan for how and when to discount, that's different. But yeah, if you're just saying, oh, it's a tough market, fine, 10%, then you might as well not have bothered investing in all of those other parts of your business strategy. Okay, so the importance of value, importance of service and strategy and business uh, business model being linked through to, to price obviously being important there. Um, and, and again, directly a question is actually coming from John DeCosta, um, quite simply, um, fixed fee versus percentage. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, John obviously wanted to put that forward. Um, any thoughts on that, John? And uh, any, any detail around that, or we can uh, we can push forward? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I um, I'm a great supporter of changing parts of how recruiters price, but actually, percentage of salary is a godsend. It's worked incredibly well. Salaries go up over time, so that means that our fees go up over time. Uh, if you had fixed your fees twenty years ago. You said, great, I'll do three grand oh, back then. Yeah, 
fifteen hundred pounds, maybe a thousand pounds for placement. Every few years, you'd have to go back to your clients and have a very awkward conversation about how you're raising your prices. And that happens in a lot of industries. We're incredibly lucky in our industry on perms to say we'll take a percentage of the salary. And that percentage, I would guess most people haven't raised their percentages or even changed their percentages very much over the last 10, 20 years. But your average fee in pounds has gone up because you've got that locked into percentage. So, yeah, fixed fees, people talk about transparency, talk about being more open with their clients or making it easier to understand. But there's a significant downside to going fixed fee. Okay, fine. So, uh, so John, hopefully that uh, that helps and answers your question as well. Um, Neil MacArthur, I know that you um, put in a comment um, before the session started about uh, this might just save our bacon. So, if you are listening at the moment and got any uh, expansion on that, then um, we'd be uh, would be interested in uh, in hearing from you on that as well. Um, so, in, uh, in terms of retained business and overcoming pricing in that respect. Um, you know, how can a business at the moment secure more retained business um, and indeed do just that, overcome pr- any pricing uh, uh, respect, respectfully of that? Yeah, yeah. So fixed fees, retainers, that's another example of ways that are known in the industry to, to mix the pricing up. I think the contingent versus retained argument um, is slightly inward looking from our point of view. If you break it down to clients at one level, you're saying, would you like to pay later? Or would you like us to send you a couple of invoices at different times? Yeah, that's all it is. If we're talking about adding value to the client, you're not adding value, you're talking about invoicing dates um, to be slightly facetious. So I'd be- Okay, well, to talk more about that because Obviously, we're talking about stage of payments, when the payments are coming in, et cetera. And that surely has to link then to, to value and stuff, which comes before, you know, how the pricing model is, is laid out. So, yeah. so what I'd suggest, not get focused, not start with we need to, to do a retained model. Yeah. Or we need to stick with our contingent model. Go back quite a few steps and think, right, how are we creating value and how are we talking to our clients about the services we offer them? And um, briefly, what I do for recruitment agencies is help them move to a, uh, to, I help them give their clients a choice of services. So classically three options. And you'll see examples of that uh, in other B2B industries, you know, buying software, you'll often see three options. Um, yeah. B2C, you see that, uh, be that wine lists and good, better, best wines travel insurance you so see that. multiple multiple price points basically exactly yeah um but it's the price points are useful but it's what's within each of those packages or within each of those services that's really useful so you need to understand your clients um but once you've created that choice you can go in and say okay well i can do quite a light option so let's talk about do you want to just get this done quickly you want a few cvs over and whatever else is in that package. Or let's look at the top end. Hey, I can roll out the red carpet for you. I can video interview. I can go on every single job board. I can sit in on interviews with you. Um, We can do post-placement work. We can do coaching. Yeah, the list is endless. And I think that is why you need to understand what your clients in your niche value and what you can deliver on. Once you've done that, creating that choice of services really turns the conversation with from your with your client from being very price focused so if we go what most people do now you go in and say i will recruit for you the salary is 40k so it's 25 percent. where does the client go from there they negotiate all you've done is say mm-hmm. we'll do the job for 25 percent. you're really just saying here's the price come at me If you go in and say, there are three approaches I can take to solve your problem. Let's have a look at those and let's talk about which one fits for you. The client is opening up about what they need from you, what they value. So they might look at your top option and say, wow, 
that's really impressive and that's nice. <laughs> You're building a halo effect there. So they're looking at that top option thinking, wow, that's brilliant. But I don't want all of those things. And I can see the price and I don't want to pay that much. So then you have a consultative conversation about which services they do need and what they are willing to pay. And you can see the difference between the two, right? You've either led them to just a win-lose negotiation or with three options, you're talking about what works for them, what they value, and it almost becomes you're creating a bespoke service out of your packaged services. And that's really powerful. Um, my theory is people only have so much time to spend on negotiation. So actually, if you're talking to them about value and service, they spend less time pushing on price. So it sounds like you're putting more emphasis on the value and the service, bringing that to the fore. That's the main agenda. And then the, the pricing element becomes um, a bit more of a sort of formality. So to exactly. Speak. I've also sat with, you know, I've used this with clients myself, obviously. And, um, you know, I've had you know, HR directors who work through this and they understand the logic. They understand why the price exists and why one is more expensive and why getting something from you is more expensive than getting a, a lower level service. Um, so actually, during negotiations, they've, <laughs> they've half pushed because it's habit. And then they've almost backed off negotiating because they've said, well, uh, I can see why I would have to pay more for that. So you're giving them the answers um, as to why you're not just going to drop your price to, to match a competitor or you're not just going to go to 10%. Okay, well, this sounds pretty compelling stuff that could help an awful lot of companies, agencies, et cetera. Um, we're talking about it now. In your experience, how many companies have adopted multiple pricing points? Um, what are the barriers or the reasons why companies haven't adopted them? Um, and if they're not working for certain agencies, if they have got them into play, why might that be the case? Have you experienced, you know, companies just ineffectively putting those three price points into play? Because, you know, underpinning a lot of what you're saying here, you know, this could be a, a fundamental takeaway, a very sort of tangible thing that people put, in, can put into their business pretty quickly um, in an important time to do it. Yeah, a few points. I absolutely recommend think about how you would do this. Um, it's not easy. I think with what I say about pricing and packaging services is there's a lot of complexity to it. And almost the hardest bit is working through that yourself. It's your job. Right, and I can help you. It's my job to help you. Um, you've got to work through that so that what you come up with is a really simple, easy to understand pricing model. So three clear options that you consult to your clients and they understand. And if you've got other consultants, your consultants can pick it up and quickly sell it confidently to their clients as well. So this is going to make it easier for the consultants as well. Is that what we're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if I've rolled it out to yeah, over a thousand consultants during my time at Reed. And uh, yeah, I've then gone back to them and said, hey, would you, hypothetically, would you like to go back to the old way? And uh, no, no one was keen <laughs> because they're having, it creates that conversation around value and service. Yeah. What they don't want to do is go back to negotiating. You know, a consultant in an ideal situation should be selling to someone more senior than them. So that person is also likely to be better at negotiating than them. Yeah, you're pitching to a finance director. Good luck. <laughs> I don't like I don't like negotiating with finance directors. Well, I was going to lead on to say, well, is what advice have you got at the moment within the current climate for pricing negotiation? Oh, avoid finance directors. <laughs> but that might not, that might not all, always be possible. And indeed, there's been a, a flurry of questions coming in, John. So I'm going to go on to, uh, go on to them. Um, so the first one I'm just going to come to is from Jackie Mills. Um, how would you pitch it when a client says, that they have used another agency for years who offer them more competitive rates and provide a good service. So why should they come to you and pay more money? Uh, a great question. Um, I think there's a couple of points there. Firstly, if, you're, if they're engaging with you, talking to you, replying back to an email or a LinkedIn, why have they opened the door? 
you know, point. that could be, yeah, I would say that. I'd say exactly what uh, Jackie has said, their client said. Um, it's a good way of negotiating, right? You're more likely to get someone come in and pitch for a lower rate. Um, what you want to do, um, you want, uh, I say, when you build a, build services, you, you have features within those. So whether that's video recruiting or you know, video interviewing or whatever. So you've got those different features. At least one of those features needs to be a real wow feature. You need to think about yeah, USPs is the classic way of talking about it. You need something that really stands out. As we've talked about previously, Matt, there's a lot of um, uh, recruiters out there. So we have fallen into the trap of thinking, oh, we all do the same thing. It's perfectly possible to find a USP or a wow factor. And you really need that in a competitive market. And that's your answer, as well as questioning why they're talking to you if they're completely happy. Um, but you then need something really punchy. And that often involves taking a risk, a big risk. Um, and one of the things when you look at how you're building your services is looking at what your clients value that you can deliver. So ideally you want your clients to perceive this wow factor as a real risk. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I'm a big fan of extended guarantees. Um, and one of the things I've used in the past is uh, to get into the exec search market was um, 12 month guarantees. And we were blowing everyone out of the water with that for our uh, target market. You know, some people had no guarantees, some people had three months. Yeah, they were talking about it in days or weeks. And we just said, a year, we'll give you a year. And your clients, clients coming back to us saying, what are you doing? <laughs> you, we, don't, we don't believe you or we don't, I mean, they, they were questioning it, but what they were saying was, tell us more. It was a wow factor. And we'd done some of the maths and we took a bit of a punt. Um, but we knew that this was something that clients valued that made a big statement and they got us in the room and got us talking. And then you back that up by showing that you've done it before, you're a good consultant, you understand the market, yeah, everything everyone on here knows how to do. But yeah, create- And in, and in retrospect, was it worth the risk? Oh yeah, massively, paid off, uh, hugely. Um, we had a few nervous, the fine, our finance director was nervous. But okay, we, fine. But um, yeah, I suppose, I suppose the end of Jackie's question there. So why should they come to you and pay more money is a good question to look inwardly and ask yourself as uh, as well in terms of your service, which comes back to your value service element. So. Yeah, and ask yourself what would they pay more money for? Mm -hmm. Again, if you're stuck on saying I do recruitment, they do recruitment, you're not going to get anywhere. If you say, well, look what I can offer. What are, you in, what are you excited by? What are you interested in? So then are we talking about bona fide, real um, multiple price points on three different service elements? Or are we talking psychology or, you know? But yeah, and they need to be genuine options. So one of the things, the, the psychology behind this um, is it's all about choice. If you get your clients making a choice, then they're going to buy into what they decide to do. If you tell them the price is 25%, they're gonna say, well, that's what you say, here's what I think. Um, whereas if you say, here's three options, what do you think is best for you? They're having to engage a different part of their brain. They're thinking, well, what is best? Let's think for this situation. Okay, let's say I go for the middle option. I've chosen the middle option. I've, li I've engaged much more in that process. I yeah. can see what the price is. I've chosen that price. Of course, I've been well trained as a client. I'm going to ask for a discount. Yeah. But I've chosen, I'm engaged in this, I'm involved in this process. I'm not being told what the price is. Okay. And and uh, John, massively interesting that was. And you know, we'll we'll probably dig into it a bit more in a moment as well. But I do just want to come on to John the Costa again, because he's just come back to your point around the uh, the 12 months and wondered what's what the what was the scale over the 12 months basically for the guarantee. Oh, in terms of staggered? Yeah. Uh, staggered, got rid of all that. 
Um, Good of all that. So completely simplify, simplified. Yeah, yeah. You know, I talked about it all out. We, we worked out the challenges. We put something really simple together so that, again, a new consultant could go out and say, here's how it works. Um, earlier on in my career, you know, I read when I was looking at various um, products, services, I'd sit down with consultants and I'd say, cool, um, how does the, uh, the staggered uh, rebate work? And some of them would be, I remember one, one person, great consultant, really proud. They were like, oh, I've come up with a pizza diagram. So they got out this diagram and they drew it. <laughs> it's just like, that's cool. That's, that's a good 10 minutes of a sales pitch. <laughs> I'm trying to explain your rebate. <laughs> so we just realized yeah, clients aren't that interested. And again, it undermined the statement that we were trying to make. You, you take, there's no point making a wow factor and then putting an asterisk next to it. So, so then, I think, I think John is, um, you know, um, maybe sort of picking himself up off the floor with the, su the suggestion here, because he said, uh, so 100% refund over 12 months. <laughs> Is that correct? Uh, I think we tested that for a bit. Uh, I think we changed it. We refined it over time, um, but kept it simple. It didn't go back to a pizza. of. It, it wasn't massively one complicated. One eighth here and two eighths here and three eighths here. And then. Okay. Yeah. Again, again, this is sparking some interest here. So, um, uh connor it's just coming okay is it just a 12 month replacement or do you offer to refund the fee can i say i think this is proving my point find something that's wow and people get interested right yeah it's a good point john i think you've delivered there <laughs> absolutely we don't want to spend better than pizza. Pizza. um I replacements um again it wasn't committing enough it was saying it, it wasn't bold enough so we went for feedback and there, there was there was some internal complexity, as I said. But yeah, we didn't fudge what the client saw. We weren't like 12 month guarantee for a bit. <laughs> and then right. it, down, like, it didn't just trail off into something less. So there, there was a refund of the fee if it was applicable, basically. Yeah. OK, fantastic. Um, and then also we've got Steve just wondering, uh, what are your thoughts on scaling up and down? Uh, against bespoke service delivery yes so i think that's a i saw that one earlier really interesting one um that is part of the model of having those three services and talking about service so um you could go in and say you use your current pricing model and say right it's 25 percent, and they say well i want to pay 20 percent, or i want to pay 15 percent. you say okay i'm going to take something out but that's a defensive, reactive way of doing things. Sure. So the proactive way of doing that is to lay out your services in advance and say, look, there are different options and you can slide up and down. Um, so it, it almost invites that. So you're spot on, Steve. That's definitely a good way of doing things. But prompt that conversation, put those three options out there, um and then within that you can slide between them um so i actually had a client a while ago who was a client of mine so um built them three a, a three service pricing model and i said oh yeah which one do you sell the most of and they said two and a half so they'd they'd created this uh these valuable services and packaged them in a way that all of their clients were saying, great, I really like three, but I'm not going to commit to all of that. Two just doesn't have enough. So every time she was making, creating a bespoke service from her framework. So as Steve says, it, it was leading to a bespoke service where you're sliding in and out. Um, but you're really encouraging that conversation. It's a great conversation to be having. And the alternative is just fighting about numbers. 25%, 10%, 15%. So yes, you want to be talking about service and the, what value goes on. Which again, we want to be trying to get away from uh, as much as possible. Value service being the uh, uh, the main yeah, I can see John's comment. I'll, uh, John, I'm not going to give away every uh, detail of all of my clients and what they do, but drop me a line afterwards and I'll, uh, I'll share something a bit more confidential. Hopefully that answers your question, John, and uh, you, can, uh, you can give a follow-up.
Um, on to Kathy, who has asked, uh, and loads of questions coming in here, which is fantastic and shows how important a subject it is, obviously. Um, from Kathy, how do you suggest dealing with PSL situations where if you don't work at a certain level, um, you don't get put forward uh, for the PSL, i.e. little or no chance to negotiate? Uh, lots of our accountancy clients uh, now operate using this model. Yeah, PSL is super hard. Um, it's smart by clients on a pricing point of view. I, I would argue they don't get the best service by doing that, but you know, um, there's logic to what they're doing. It is very hard. Um, I'd say you want to take a step back. You want to, you're unlikely to persuade a client to blow up their PSL for you. So think about other ways around it. Firstly, try and avoid current clients moving to PSLs. Uh, that will benefit you. Um, it is worth saying that PSLs are usually put in place by finance departments or even worse, procurement teams. They are not universally loved in the company. So don't think that a company says, great, you have to be on a PSL and everyone will sign up to that. Um, I don't think those companies would, or I don't think procurement people would love me for saying this, but go in and wow the key people in that business. Um, a nice example I remember is, uh, yeah, I, I had a client who was, um, yeah, PSL for all their staff. Uh, so, yeah, that was that. The CEO then needs a new finance director. Yeah, key hire. Guess what? They didn't stick to the PSL. <laughs> they they went with the best recruitment agency they could find. So find ways to go outside that PSL. If if you're on the PSL and it's a it's a bulk of roles, short term, you've got to go with it. But yeah, try and work around that. Try and find people who are willing to pay more um and i mean just coming back to kathy's question is that lots of their accountancy clients now operate using this model so if a good percentage of your clients are using that model then albeit desirable might not be practical to be able to go to clients that are outside the psl anything well, else that can... I, like i say one of the hardest questions or hardest challenges to solve so i'm not going to I'm not going to make it easy and I'm not going to answer it, you know, find the solution in a sentence. Um, I think play the long game uh, for the clients where you are already on a PSL. Build up, understand what they value. You're already in there. You're talking to them. You're a, yeah, you're a supplier to them. So you have that relationship. You have a better relationship than if you're just pitching. Understand what would wow them. And also while you're building wow services for the rest of your clients, start drip feeding that to them and then see how they react. And then of course explain that, well, the PSL service that they've signed up to doesn't include that. So if we're talking about a 12 month guarantee, yeah, I wouldn't give that to a PSL client. Yeah, it's it's about like communication, a lot of communication around it basically. Yeah. And so again, element. yeah, I get, I guess don't give up. Don't don't say, oh, yeah, again, don't default back to recruitment. Oh, you, you get our recruitment at 10% or 15%, whatever it is. Um, you can say, okay, you, you get our standard service and you get it at a discount because of the volume and the agreement we've signed up to. But look at all the exciting stuff. Look at what we do for other clients um, and tempt them out. FOMO, fear of missing out. Great. Love that to say. Yeah. And maybe just tantalize them with some guarantees as well. So <laughs> <laughs> seems to work today. <laughs> yeah, fine, sure. Um, just one final question from Tanya. Um, in South Africa, there are recruiters on every corner in South Africa. What are your thoughts on strict compliance when opening an agency? Um, and yeah, has led on to say this could possibly up the confidence a bit for professional recruiters. So didn't know whether you had any comments on that at all, John. There are recruiters on every corner in SA. What are your thoughts on strict compliance when opening an agency? Yeah, so I guess reputation, again, um, <clears throat> I'll use the 12-month guarantee thing because it's a, it's a nice <laughs> goal. 
Seems going, to be going above and beyond to prove, put the burden of proof on you. Don't just say, oh, I'm ISO, whatever, whatever your equivalent guarantee of um, uh, compliance is. It's on you to create that risk. And um, I'll give you an example that I used a lot when I was, you know, when I talk about guarantees. Um, Kia, nowadays a low to mid tier brand of car, KIA, sorry. Um, but when they first came to the UK as a you know, South Korean, they were possibly one of the first South Korean car models. Yeah. They came with South Korean, um, <laughs> wherever they came from. Um, they came over and everyone was like, who are they? You know, they've got no brand, they've got no recognition, they've got no quality. Like, who are they? Seven year guarantee. Most people don't keep their cars for seven years. So again, it was that like, wow, well, they can't be any good. They're just some new entrant I've never heard of. Oh, hang on. They guarantee their service. They guarantee their car for seven years. Well, that changes things. And now I'm interested. I'm leaving the door open to talk to them. They're, they're on my list. Yeah, sure, I'll consider a Ford or whatever else. But um, they're on the list. So yeah, if, if compliance is a big issue for your clients, and remember, that's the key thing. It's not whether it's big a big issue for you is whether it's a big issue for your clients. But if, if it's a big issue for your client, go out of your way to prove it in a way that really demonstrates it and impresses people. Cool, John, well, thank you very much. And I hope that um, answers uh, the question okay. And um, indeed on the previous answer as well, Kathy came back saying great ideas, thank you very much. And it'd be interesting to see in the sidebar there any comments from people who might think of adopting um, John's thoughts on uh, you know a guarantee option. As a, as a wow factor or, you know, some version of that. Um, in the meanwhile, John, what advice have you got at the moment for startups, smaller businesses wanting to get their pricing model right? Hmm. <clears throat> I realize I'm banging on about three options, but that's, that's, that's the key message today, right? So that's uh, your one option, your three options. <laughs> <laughs> well, the smaller agencies and startups especially, if you're going in, you, you might have to take a bit of a punt as you build those services, but you're going to learn so much more. I talked before about having a value conversation with your client. So you sit down with your client, you say, there are three ways I could fill this job. What's important to you? You're going to have that conversation. You're going to learn. You're going to learn about what they think about your price points from low to high. Mm -hmm. you're going to think about the services you're currently offering. And as a startup, you're going to be nimble. You're going to be able to, say cool that doesn't work slot that one out i'll find something to go in there if you go in and say i do your recruitment 20 percent, what are you learning there if they say yes what have you learned if they say no what have you learned what, what do they value <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you whereas if you've had that value conversation they say oh wow video interviewing i love that i really like that idea mm -hmm. uh, we've not had that before or yeah, we're getting so many CVs in at the moment. This is our big problem. And this service helps us solve that. You're getting so much more information. So in the first year of business, you're going to learn, you're going to hear how your clients think and ultimately what they're willing to pay for. So I'd say, yeah, create those conversations, talk about value. Um, and yeah, you'll be in a much better place. And let that be your compass effectively. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. John, that, that's very interesting. And the final thing I just want to touch upon, obviously, we are in turbulent, changing, bizarre times, if you yeah. like, at the moment. Year or two on, any predictions, thoughts on what pricing models are going to look like then? Yeah, obviously, I hope more people are offering three options and services to their clients. Um, it's good for me. Um, it's good for the clients because they're seeing what services you're uh, offering. They're getting a choice and they're mm -hmm. choosing what they want you to do. It's good for your consultants because it's an easier sell and they get to be more consultative. And it's good for you know, the agency owners who are on here um, because the ROI is massive. It, it leads to more revenue. And, more sure. and of course, perm temp contract, the different role types changes uh, in that at all very quickly, John, as we, as we close up here. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think um, I, I always talk about PERM on things like this because it's the easiest, it's the simplest to understand, it's the most transparent. Um, the psychology around choice and options works exactly the same for temps, but temps is a hundred times more complex. So don't just jump in there and uh, mix things up. You know, anyone who runs a temps desk or temps team knows you can lose money on a temps deal. Um, so it, you need to be careful. So, yes, you can. And with that, any stats in terms of you know increasing price and how that links to profit and that kind of thing? Yeah, so for a typical recruitment agency with a typical profit margin, um, again, we're talking averages here, but a 1% improvement in price leads to a 10% improvement in profit. Because if you're increasing that revenue, there's no costs with improving your price. If your price is higher, that's more money in the bank. That's more profit. And I should say a 1% improvement on perm pricing is not 15% to 16%. It's 15% to 15.15%. So if you're thinking, would I be able to raise my fees that much and drive profit. Yes, you don't do it just by pushing a class to pay you more. But yeah, you can quickly see that if your fees start going up, your profit goes up uh, exponentially. Well, certainly that's very important and very interesting and links through to return on investment as well. Um, and John, I think that concludes this afternoon. I mean, thank you so much for all of your comments and insight and the loads of questions that came through. So that was really fab to see as well. Pricing is so important, so important to get it right, but also link it to the value, the service elements of your business. So um, very insightful. Thank you very much indeed for your time. No problem. I see Amy has just posted my, yeah, posted my uh, LinkedIn. So yeah, please connect with me. Um, I've got a couple of different services. Um, ways i can help people and again for ad hoc questions get in touch i like connecting with people fantastic so for those uh, digestible and uh, accessible options from john do give him a, a shout um and join us in two weeks time when we will be speaking about growth strategy at the moment and going forward we're going to be joined by david higgins who is non-exec director at Levy UK. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for tuning in this afternoon. Great to see you as always. Take care.